The way people work is changing dramatically. Today, it's all about remote work. There are thousands of companies that work with a remote team, and there are lots of resources available on how to make it work. In this episode, Mike Riley and Mike Ferrante discuss how to do things remotely in real estate and give us ideas on how to do marketing and purchasing in the virtual world. We discuss these things and more at the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast. Hi, everybody. It's Mike Riley again on a cold, snowy, almost the end of January with my uh, my partner, Mike Ferrante of Century 21. Mike, good morning. Hey, Mike. Good to be here. All right. So you, okay, so give me your uh, caffeine uh, content. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cappuccino and a decaf tea already down the pipe this morning. <laughs> okay. Well, I took your lead. I'm getting uh, into that. Uh, uh, herb, um, green tea in the morning, first thing off. But this time I'm mixing it in with a, uh, a turmeric shot, a ginger turmeric shot, little, just to give it a little extra whatever. Um, yeah, the health benefits of turmeric are supposed to be plenty. Yeah, so before we get into realty, realty and real estate, we'll talk uh, for just a minute about uh, health tips and uh, I've been getting into, uh, you know, for years, a uh, ginger root and beets and uh, turmeric. And I just was reading about how to make turmeric shots. And it's just amazing. If you got a, a Vitamix, Vitamix, you know, you just get ginger root, you get turmeric root, chop it all up, get some coconut water, throw it in there, add some more turmeric powder and just churn it up. And there you go very concentrated. So, but I thought, you know, today's topic, we would get into um, uh, how to do things remotely. And given the weather, given the storms on the north, northeast, I mean, you know, Cleveland, up until a couple of weeks ago was pretty, uh, was pretty dry. There was no snow on the ground. People were saying, wow, we haven't gotten any snow. And then all of a sudden we get, you know, a foot to 14 inches. And uh, in a couple of days, we're supposed to get another eight to 10 inches storm coming up from the south Wednesday, Thursday. So, so here we are, here I am sitting in uh, my living room with the, my uh, natural gas fire going, talking to you on my earbuds. And uh, I wanted to just talk to people about how to buy a house remotely. Now, we're buying our houses in Cleveland and we live in Cleveland, but we have one of our um, investors, Rachel from LA, who is um, signing a purchase agreement to buy one of our, uh, our managed properties where the tenants are already in place. I, I know she's actually going to buy one and then, you know, convert it into an Airbnb. But we have another of our clients who bought one of our actually a couple of our properties with the tenants are already in place, but they're all doing this remotely. Okay. So we're, <laughs> we're going to be taking Rachel in the next uh, week or so when the snow melts, we're going to take her on a, uh, on a zoom or slash FaceTime uh, tour of the house and show her, you know, the good, bad, and not so ugly because the ugly were cleaning up, you know, before she uh, sends us the money and, buys the house what, what's your I know, I know you do a lot of facetime stuff mike you know people can go to your facebook page right and, and see your your wares you right. do a little uh, tour i want you to elaborate on what you've been doing the last year on that yeah so we started doing that stuff even before covid so you know we were really well prepared for the virtual world and the and the increase in sort of the marketing and and purchasing that went on sight unseen I read a stat recently, Mike, that nationwide, about 50% of offers were being made sight unseen. And I read this in a couple of different sources, because when I read it, I said, that can't be true. And, and so I, I did some more research, and it was Redfin, it was Zillow, it was Trulia. There were articles and blogs talking about, about you know 50% of offers being made sight unseen. Now, the buyers, in most cases, eventually end up seeing the house, but not in all cases. Like you were saying, with investor purchases... A lot of these investors are not only out of state, but overseas. So they're relying on virtual means to do their due diligence on properties. So back to your question, what we've been doing 
we've been doing virtual tours that are recorded on YouTube, on our Facebook channel, you know, 21 Mike Team Facebook page and the Mike Ferrante Cleveland Realtor YouTube channel. Uh, and those are resources that are just static. They're there. People could look at them anytime. Uh, but I think that the in-person walkthrough has become more and more prevalent because people want to interact. You know, we're either on a FaceTime call or Zoom or, um, you know, all the different methods that you can WhatsApp, all these different video methods, and you can walk through and be interactive with the buyer. They, they can say, hey, what's that door go to right there? Or what's that brown stain on the carpet? You know, and while the only, and I, jokingly in an inter interview that I said once, look, I said, the only thing they can't do is smell the property. So <laughs> they're <laughs> relying on you to say, hey, this carpet smells bad, but pretty much everything hey, else they can take Mike, in virtually. Don't, Mike, don't rule that out with 5G. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's going to be some add on app for 5G that you can actually take a, take a smell, put your, put your, uh, your nose goggles on or something and yeah sniff, right and sniff the house so <laughs> but uh you know what okay so let's uh you know for somebody who's zooming internationally from uh, you know from california and we're getting a lot of calls from california let's go through a checklist of what they need to really look at on facetime and i'm going to just start out by saying one of the i think one of the important features doesn't have to be FaceTime is to go on Google or one of the search engines and look at the crime stats in the area. And, uh, you know, is, is there a lot of crime in the area? Is it just sort of miscellaneous? I mean, crimes popped up a lot in the last year, you know, during COVID and whatever, but uh, elaborate on that, Mike. Well, we have two sites that we refer people to, to, to do that kind of research. And, and there are others. You could just search city crime map, Trulia has a nice crime map, and then there's also a, a site that I think is an amazing source of data. It's called city-data.com, city-data.com, and you could go there, and they break it down by type of crime. They break it down by income, who lives in the neighborhood, renters versus buyers, and all the kind of stuff that realtors don't like talking about, like ethnicity and religion and all those things that we can get in trouble for fair housing stuff. It's real simple. I tell them go to city-data.com and look it up or, you know, network with people like you with other investors and, and find out what's going on. But the crime statistics are out there and easily accessible. And, and um, buyer beware on the crime stats because they can be a little bit misleading. It go, this goes to what we were talking about on a few podcasts about micro-targeting. Yep. Uh, I mean, for example, our uh, Forest Hill area, which I have been evangelizing for the last couple of years we're uh forest hill also has a east cleveland component to it and but that east cleveland forest hill is worlds apart from east cleveland proper which is down the hill so you could um i know we've had some people we've had to talk off the ledge they they coming in for two three months Maybe they're going to the clinic and they're renting one of our uh, furnished Airbnbs that are in East Cleveland. I mean, in one case, that the people are living right across the street from my son's house, from Brooks' house on Wyatt Road. That's one of our properties, and they were, they would love the house. They just was like like the proximity. But then they started talking to some friends and they go, "Oh my God, you're not you know renting in East Cleveland, are you?" And then they, you know, they've already plunked money down. Now they're calling panicking. And I'm telling them, listen, yeah, we're in East Cleveland, but this is not East Cleveland, East Cleveland. Okay. This is, you know, that's, that's down the hill and, and a mile away. Okay. You know, where you get a, a questionable neighborhood, your thoughts, Mike. Well, you know, you're exactly right, Mike. And this is one of those things where for virtually everything, I say, I feel like people could say, yeah, but Mike, you know, 44112, if I look that up, it looks really bad. And, you know, that's East Cleveland. And that's why the local expert is so important. You know, there are these great tools and people kind of feel empowered by them, but you really need to be able to filter through the data that's available to interpret it. So, for example, if you did a crime search in 44112, you would 
come to the conclusion, well, 44112 has a lot of crime. I don't want to buy there. But then you find this neighborhood, Forest Hill, that is you know largely in that zip code, if not all. And that's a unique little gem of a neighborhood that most people might overlook because they don't have the whole story. Right, exactly. And you got to think about, again, we go back to micro-targeting. There are, look, you could go to New York. You can go to L.A. I mean, you know, uh, you, you drive a couple of blocks and you're in an area that's maybe having a little bit more crime, but they're, they're miles apart in reality. They're, they're whole different neighborhoods. I think with Cleveland, there are areas that are, uh, especially in this seller's market, that are going to be coming in the, la- in the next year or two, coming on strong. They're going to be the next destination neighborhoods like Forest Hill. And they all have one thing in common, which was they were adjoining or near an area where there was some crime. There was some, you know, stolen cars or this and that. But you had an opportunity to go in there and buy this property. And within a year or two, it was in a gentrified neighborhood. You want to give me any examples on that? Well, I can give you historical examples. I think the other thing that these neighborhoods have in common is that maybe on one side, they're in that high crime, less desirable area. And on the other side, they're bordered by a really desirable area. So you're a stone's throw from Coventry Village, for example, when when you're in Forest Hill. Your minutes, I mean, you could ride your bike to University Circle from Forest Hill. So I think that's the other thing. When people speculate on neighborhoods, they also tend to look at uh, what areas are likely to expand? Where is that gentrification? Where is that um, uniqueness, that specialness of a neighborhood going to expand? So I'll give you an example. On the west side of Cleveland, you have Ohio City and Tremont. You know, many, many years ago, those areas started becoming the hip, cool, you know, art gallery, bar, restaurant areas. And so now those property values have skyrocketed. They're established. I don't think they're going anywhere. But uh, recently, you had expansion of that of those neighborhoods into Detroit Shoreway, Gordon Square. And now there's speculation going on that even in the Madison, um, you know, up in the, close to West 98th Street, that that expansion is going on. I'm seeing home sale prices much higher than I've ever seen in those neighborhoods because the expansion is going on. Um, so those are the kinds of areas that when I look at people and they say, well, what are you, you know, what areas might I speculate on? There's another one, Mike, and I don't know what your take is on Slavic village. You know, I, many, many years ago, I owned a duplex in Slavic village and I sold it, but now there's this Renaissance going on there and I'm, I'm dubious, you know, I'm looking at it saying, I don't know if it's a sustainable Renaissance. Have you done much with Slavic village? No, no, and I would stay away from that. I, I just yeah, think it's I, just too. I'm, I, I'm I think doubtful. it's just a, uh, um, you know, what's that expression? I just think it's just too. It's too heavy a lift to yeah. get Slav- Slavic Village turned around. I mean, there's some areas that I'm real dubious on um, on the east side. You know, Wood Hill Larchmere is an interesting area. Um, yeah. it's it's a kind of a hipster area. Um, yeah, a lot of great restaurants, art galleries nice old school duplexes there but you know what you don't have to go very far and you're into a questionable area yeah so, or right down the hill the other way you're in university circle you ever do the larchmere porch fest mike nope that's nope. uh usually june i think and everybody just gets out on their porches and they'll have live bands playing and food and music and all this stuff going on it looks like an interesting event I, i've never been but it looks pretty cool right. well it's like hessler street in uh, University Circle. That was a great kind of block party. I think this is where, the, I'll toot your horn, Mike, where you really need a good, sharp realtor who knows the neighborhoods, who knows, who can talk about investing in areas that are up and coming, not areas that are already white hot, like Little Italy, like Ohio City. I mean, I think some of those prices are unsustainable i think they're approaching more sort of bubble territory what's your thoughts yeah, uh could be you know as i just recently did the numbers i, I did a 10-year look back and kind of tried to forecast what was going to happen i don't know that we're heading for a bubble just because the data doesn't seem to su- support it because the supply still so far exceeds the demand but what i could see happening is a serious plateau And if you're trying to invest and hit the home run of both cash flow and appreciation, 
I think when you're investing in those areas that are either already at a plateau or nearing a plateau, you lose that benefit. So if you're, hey, if you're happy with the cash flow, great, but just don't count on much, if any, appreciation. Okay. So we're working, again, the, the theme of this podcast is we're working remote. So we're looking at the maps. We're getting ourselves up to speed on the different neighborhoods, the crime stats. Is a heavy concentration of duplexes, is that a warning sign, Mike? I, I think in most cases, yes. You know, we look at Cleveland Heights a lot of times and, you know, I'll rattle off a couple of street names here and you kind of nod your head. I bet Altamont, you know, yeah. all, uh, you know, that that is a street that street's a perfect example of high concentration of renters, which won't show up on citydata.com. You know, they're going to tell you what the ratio of renters to owner occupants is for Cleveland Heights, but they won't tell you, well, Altamont's one of those streets where we know there's a lot of renters or, or Beachwood is another one. And you can see that there's more duplexes on that street too. So I think it's definitely worthy of raising an eyebrow when you see that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to say universally, you know, because you go to a neighborhood like Ohio City and Tremont, and I'll tell you, I would love to own some duplexes down there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, this is where it, it, you know, to somebody in California or somebody in Australia or whatever, looking to um, to buy, uh, you really need to have a guide. And you know what? You need to open up your pocketbook. You know, maybe if you're going to be seriously investing in Cleveland real estate, uh, you got to be prepared to hire a consultant. And that, that, that's what I've come to realize because uh, I'm getting people calling me. Now, I know we've talked about this before, so, but they're calling, they're calling in, they, for the podcast, they want this, they want, you know, I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of that, thinking of that. And listen, I don't have any time to just give this stuff away for free. I mean, it's all well and good for the podcast, but I tell people, look at, we've got a 150 for the first hour and we're happy to walk you through the maps. And, and direct you and then you can just go work the realtor you know bring then bring mike in mike's team yeah. in but i'll give them the the areas that i think are, are gonna do well and where we're investing our in our with our own money and directing our own clients in but that's not i'm not giving that away for free if i can add on to that mike the other thing that's critical apart from the knowledge and expertise is the speed of response. And what I mean by this is that it's a tough market right now if you're trying to buy. If you drag your feet, if it takes you three days to do your research and get back and formulate an offer and submit it, you've already missed your opportunity on most properties that are hitting the market. Uh, right. Unless they're grossly overpriced or have some other big flaw. And then those are opportunities, you know, for maybe for something to linger on the market. But if you can't turn around from uh, becoming aware of the property to visiting it, evaluating it and making a decision and making an offer. If you can't do that in 24 to 48 hours, in most cases, you're missing the opportunity. Right. Well, let's and continue it's hard. on. Yeah. Doing let's it virtual continue. is hard. Okay. So we've talked about the maps, the neighborhoods, hiring our group to give you that one hour of detailed information and jump over to Century 21 to actually pull the trigger on buying a property within those circles. So we've talked about that. The next thing I want to talk about is, okay, FaceTime slash Zoom slash Google me. We're doing an inspection of the house, what to look for. Now here's a few th boxes to check off. My, my own sort of uh, homemade checklist. One is the houses around your house, the street. And if you're buying a house that needs some work, you don't want to be buying that house if there's 12 other houses on that street that need work. A lot of times you can really pick up a, a gem buried in the rubble. Uh, well, um, if it's the only house on the street that's in bad shape, if you have your neighbors on either side, across the street, behind you, meticulously taking care of their house, cutting the grass, shoveling the snow, no uh, broken down cars in the backyard. Now that's the first box to check. Your thoughts? Yeah, I love that point, Mike. That's uh, you're wise beyond your years. Uh, the 
thing about it is that I hear people say, oh, it, it's okay. I have a home inspector. I got a great home inspector who tells me everything. No, they don't because they're there to do uh, an evaluation of that property. And they don't, they're not going to take a look at the street and give you their opinion of the street, the neighboring houses, all that kind of stuff. So just a home inspection isn't enough. The other part of that is that the home inspectors have certain criteria they follow. So if you're not having your property manager look at the property through that filter, because you'll look at it and say, well, look, uh, this is, may not be a huge problem today, but three years from now, when I'm managing this property for you, you better be prepared to spend this kind of money because here's what I see. You have a different filter that you're looking through. Right. And I've seen, uh, we, we become aware just working at properties on our, on the contracting side where, boy, I've told the owner, the landlord, I, I think you need to get out of this house. I don't think this, this uh, street is sustainable. Now that's going to start to change because we have uh, new management in Cleveland Heights. We have new, we have a mayor. Um, we have council people. Um, in fact, I even threw my hat in the ring because there's a vacant council seat and I got interviewed. So I'm one of 15, but the chances of me becoming a councilman or like, I don't know, like the Cavs winning the NBA title. Um, there's a chance, but I wouldn't count on it. Okay. <laughs> but because uh, I'm, I'm an old, well, not old, but yeah, I'm old. I'll, I'll be 69 this in September. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm an old white guy. Okay. Uh, even though he's growing up in Cleveland Heights. Uh, but, you know, I don't check that uh, diversity box. And I'm a little bit too much of a bomb thrower. So I think some council people who support me would say, oh, I don't know, this guy's going to be a bull in the China shop. But we've got new management there and their focus is, is going to be on housing. Now, whether they have the ability to turn this problem around, there are streets in Cleveland Heights that adjoin East Cleveland that if I was a councilman, I would be pushed hard to focus all the resources that Cleveland Heights has on those streets because it's almost like a triage where, you know, the famous scene in Private Ryan where, you know, he's saying, you know, priority, this guy, we got to work on. We can save this guy. This guy, he's dying. He's dead. we will be dead in five minutes. This guy, he just got a, you know, he got a, he got hit in his hand. He's fine. Just banding, band. But knowing where to prioritize your resources. So triage for houses. And if you can get the city to go after these critical house streets and, and really aggressively turn them around, now you can, now you can affect some major changes in pockets of, of Cleveland Heights, but the neighborhood and look and the sustainability of the street is, is a crucial, probably the crucial box to check. Hey, let's stop here. We got to pay some bills. 30 seconds and we'll be back. If you've been listening to this podcast, then you understand or should understand the pitfalls of investing in Cleveland real estate. Say you're looking for an investment property to rent. And these are the things that could happen and often do. You overpay for a house and it's in the ghetto. Then you find that it's a money pit with endless surprise repairs. Your hapless property manager, who may be the brother-in-law of the realtor, gets a tenant who after three months stops paying the rent. Then the toilet explodes and you have nobody to repair it because guess what? The property manager is not answering the phone. Yep, that's the ugly side of the Cleveland real estate market. But we have a solution. Buy one of our properties. It's been inspected. It's been vetted. It's in a rock solid part of town. It comes with a gold star tenant paying top dollar rent. And we manage it. Call us at 216-371-8160 if you're interested. Let's move on to the next thing. What, what do you look at the exterior of the house on FaceTime? Well, you know, I think that people from outside our area don't understand some of the exteriors that we have that I don't want to say they're unique to Northeast Ohio, but they just don't have them where they're from. So, for example, we have a fair amount of wood siding and, you know, you as a painting contractor know all about wood siding. 
Uh, but that's a maintenance issue. You know, you may paint it this year, but there's 15 layers of paint underneath that. You don't know when it's going to start peeling again. So I think the siding, the aluminum siding, vinyl, brick, uh, stone, uh, understanding stucco in our climate here and, and what that means for maintenance. Windows, I think, are huge. That's a pretty big ticket item. And of course, uh, roof and foundation. Uh, the other big ticket item are your concrete asphalt driveways. Um, you know, so I think okay. I, now I, we're okay. I, let's let's back up because we're burying we were we're burying too much information to our California uh, listeners here. Uh, the couple of key things. Um, one is take a look at the garage and go inside the garage and look at the foundation of the garage, what we call the sill plates. And if they're if they're questionable, and again, uh, you know, we we can we can do this inspection for these buyers on FaceTime. Um, if, if they need to be replaced, that's a $5,000 job. Same thing with concrete floor. Concrete floor and sill plates on the inside of the garage is number one. Number two, yeah, windows are important, Mike, but they're not critical because a lot of windows that look like they're falling apart can easily be prepped, painted, caulked, put some new storms on, not, not real expensive. Also, the, the wood, wood siding, I get you. Uh, it's a maintenance issue, but look how many times it's been painted in the last five years. And we can tell that just by the number of coats that are on, on, the, um, on the siding. But on the other hand, sometimes with a house, there's only two sides of the house that gets the weather. That's the, the south side with the sun beating on it and maybe the east or the west side, and depending on how the wind's blowing. But the other two sides, not a problem. So that's, you know, just your basic exterior uh, watch points. And of course, the third one is the roof. How many layers on the roof? When was the last time the roof was put up? Is, uh, is the roof shingles curling? Um, all those things you can do remotely. And, and uh, so when you, you're looking at the house, look at those three or four triggers. Is there anything specific, Mike, uh, that would uh, come to your attention? Well, and so on, on, the the outside, roof, on the outside. Yeah. So to elaborate a little on roofs, you know, we have some other types of shingles here as well. So uh, some people may not be familiar with slate roofs or clay tile or those concrete shingles. Um, so I think, you know, understanding what type of roof you have is, is really, really important as well. And, you know, as I think about big ticket items, I think of the driveway as, as well. Um, and I know when, when we walk the outside of a house, we're always interested in where water flows. So things like, you know, not that it's big ticket items, but still you want to be aware of where water is going. Is the, is the groundwater pitching toward the house? Are the gutters dumping water next to the house? Um, I think those are some important things to look at as well. Right. And that's what we that's what we can as a contractor um, who owns rental properties, who sells properties to investors. Um, that's where we can bring tremendous value in terms of a really, really refined inspector inspection on the property that makes sense to the buyer, because we not only want to identify problem areas, but we also want to be able to project out over the next five years what you're going to have to be spending. What do you need to turn around it now to rent it? What are you going to what you know What are you going to be looking forward to in the next five years for you know capital spending? Yeah. And now we Mike, turn our attention. Go ahead, Mike. Well, let me say what you just said. I want to re repeat it because this is something I hear from investors all the time. They say, well, I just bought this house and it was all renovated. I just moved a tenant in. And in my first year, I had all these additional expenses. I don't understand how that could happen. Well, here's how that happens. You didn't listen to Mike Riley and you didn't have someone <laughs> tell you what is going to need to be done in the next one to five years. Now, Mike, it's, it, I hear the story over and over again. I've, I've had this property for three years and all I've done is spend money on it. Well, that's because someone didn't properly diagnose your one to five year expenditures coming up. Yeah, exactly. And now we turn, now we go into the inside. First thing we do is we go down the basement. We, we're FaceTiming from the basement. We're looking at the furnace. We're looking at the hot water tank. 
and then we're looking at the walls. Are they showing any signs of a chronic problem with waterproofing? Now, here's the tricky part. Sometimes the fix is pretty simple. It's just a gutter that needs to be replaced on the outside or, or a downspot that's in the ground that's got a, a crack in it. So you can identify that just in the corner, looking at the corners to see how bad is that leak uh, in the basement. Um, of course, the, uh, the electrical box is at Federal Pacific. So that's, that'll take literally 10 minutes for us going down to the basement. Then we go upstairs. What are we, what are we looking at upstairs, Mike? Well, I think that you want to look for signs of settling. You know, as you walk through a house, if you see massive shifts in the stairwells. What, like, what, like our Chadbourne house? <laughs> oh, good grief. Yeah, there was not a straight floor or wall in that house. And, you know, and then those are clues. Basically, Mike, we're de detectives. We go through a house and we look at something and we say, oh, look, there's a crack in that wall. Well, fine. You patch it and paint it. Well, no. Why did it crack? Is it just, you know, a little stress crack from, from movement, from the freeze and thaw of winter to summer? Or is it an indication of a bigger problem? So really, it's not right. just looking at it, but it's also taking the clues and telling the bigger story. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you look at, the, obviously, the key renovation points are the kitchen and the bathrooms. And a lot of times with kitchens, people can go just way overboard about what they need to do. A lot of times, if you just simply replace the, tie, the uh, counter or the flooring, put in a new sink, coat of paint, the lighting, we're not talking about a major, major, you know, renovation where you're gutting it, you're putting up, putting in new cabinets. And then the bathrooms, a lot of times it's, uh, how's the tile work looking? Um, or is the tiles bulging on the walls? That would indicate that, you know, there's a problem with, uh, you know, the, the green board behind it where it's become compromised. But most of the time, I think you're looking at houses that, when you go inside, they're pretty cleaned up unless you're buying a foreclosure, right? Well, yeah. And I, you know, one of the things I wanted to add is something that you showed me, you know, you and your guys have showed me how painting countertops and tiles, refinishing them essentially can be a great cost saving measure and a smart move in a lot of cases rather than replacement. You know, it's a good option to consider. Right. And I think for the most part, if you're buying a house to rent it, on a short term, as opposed to a long term, neighborhood's going to be key. Obviously, the the clientele we deal with, professional, they have money, they're here for three months, four months. They don't want to be living in the hood. They they want to live in a neighborhood that's safe, clean, close to where they're working, like the clinic, or UH, or you know, uh, maybe Beachwood, maybe Amazon. So that critical first look at the neighborhood. How does the neighborhood look to you? If you were driving down there and you saw a bunch of boarded up houses or empty vacant houses, I mean, do you, you think you're in a good neighborhood? I don't think so. So number one is the houses around the street. Number two is the secret big ticket items, furnace, water tank, state, state of the garage, the state of the roof. Um, the rest of the stuff is just... Uh, cosmetics agreed yeah and you know i hate to give away too many secrets here all in one podcast this is going to be our most listened to podcast with all these things we're given all these gems but the other thing <laughs> i thought about mike is as you walk through a house and decide what improvements to make and which ones not to make there's two things that become critical and are affected by these decisions so and investors don't usually put these in their thought process. Okay. And the, the number one thing is tenant quality. You know, you have to improve the property to the correct level, because if you have one of the nicer properties in the area, of course, you're going to attract the cream of the crop. You know, so I think there's a huge factor and an unquantifiable factor of tenant quality in a neighborhood, which secondly, relates to retention of tenants and vacancy is one of those variables that investors often overlook. They may say, oh, I factor in vacancy. But what if you could reduce your vacancy 
by improving your property to the correct amount or by Airbnb being it. There, there's all these other variables that I think many investors overlook. And if you have a great property that is improved to the correct level, you're going to cut down on your vacancy and you're going to improve the quality of the tenant that you attract. Right. And that's why I've enjoyed working with you, Mike, the last 10 plus years is because, and this is going to be a good segue to our final part, which is a uh, heat check is you're bringing some really sophisticated analysis on the stats, vacancy rates. Um, you know, what is this, a, are we getting into a buyer's market or is it still a seller's market or is it somewhere in between? Um, those are the things that a super good qualified realtor is going to bring to the table. We're going to bring to the table an analysis nobody else is doing, certainly not inspectors. I mean, our analysis is so much more sophisticated in terms of uh, micro-targeting and projecting out what the costs are going to be in terms of the maintenance. So with that said, let's segue to heat check. All right. I'm ready for you. I've got, uh, I recently did a 10-year study looking back at the market in single family, uh, multifamily, meaning two to four units and condos. You know, I'll probably just focus on single families for the purposes of time. Um, and by the way, if I can give a quick plug here, if you are interested in receiving this report, it's probably best for me to send it via email. And that's Mike at 21mike.com. Uh, but what's interesting for, about for a, bottle, period... for a bottle of wine, Mike, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we could talk about that for sure. <laughs> But the, the reason that this 10 year report was so interesting to me, you know, the, the period of time I chose to do is because it literally took us from 2012, which was pretty much the bottom of the recession, the bottom of the housing bust where prices were at their bottom. Uh, market time was at its top. Uh, inventory was swollen. And, and in 10 years, the pendulum has swung a full 180. We're literally at the opposite type of market. And that took... 10 years for that swing to occur. And that's yeah. what's typical of our market, Mike. Our market doesn't move dramatically. We don't see, oh, last year we had a 30% increase in value. That's really not typical for us. I know in other markets, they say, oh, I bought a condo and a, a year later I sold it for 30% more. It doesn't really happen here. We have this slow, methodical, plotting market. So just to give you an example, let, let's just talk inventory. You know, we're looking at 9,000 listings uh, 10 years ago and and down to 1500 active listings in the single family market this this past year you know so when you talk about inventory shortage that is what they mean and what's normal a balanced market where demand and supply are pretty much in sync with each other is about halfway you know maybe 5000 listings is, is is normal balanced uh, the other stat that I, that I love to look at is days on market. How long is it taking for properties to sell? And at the bottom, 2012, it was 87 days wow. was the median to sell. And, and our low this past year was nine days. That, that's the me that was the median uh, market time, time to days to sell a house for single families in, in 2021. So that just shows you how dr dramatic the shift is. Now, to look forward from that, you know, we know nothing's going to change overnight. And if it took 10 years to swing from that dramatic buyer's market to this dramatic seller's market, you know, I think 2022 is going to be pretty much a repeat of 2021, but I think we're at the bottom, you know, and I've got some different stats that I looked at that make me think that that's happening. I'm watching inventory in particular, and I think we've hit the bottom of the inventory shortage. And from here, it's going to plateau and then head back up but it's not going to happen in one or two years. Now, if you're in a, uh, a hot market like Boston, um, LA, Toronto, where all they do is talk about real estate, is when they had corrections, when, they, when the crash hit LA or the DC area, that's another hot area, in 08, the crash hit, they rebounded within a year, right? Is that, am I correct? I, I don't, I, you know, I can't really speak to those markets. I don't follow them as closely, but I think in general, the, the swing took longer than that, but certainly okay. we are slower. We're slow and steady wins the race. These other markets change and react 
faster. But right. I think that pretty much from 08, you know, things kept dropping, 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 dropping. And then 12 was the bottom. And then from there, I think you saw the markets re recover faster than what happened here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, it took a long time for these prices to bounce back up in areas like Cleveland proper, or Cleveland Heights. Right. I understand. Uh, it, it's just, we're, we're slow and steady wins the race. That's, that's us here. I'm going to throw one question out at you and we'll wrap this up which is the convergence we talked about at the beginning, the convergence of the um, being able to work remotely, FaceTime, Zoom, Google Meet, where now you can sit at your armchair, you know, and do your due diligence uh, on your laptop at how homes you're looking to buy. But does a city like Cleveland, which has tremendous opportunity to buy just a fabulous house, for a reasonable cost in a nice neighborhood compared to like an LA or San Diego. I mean, if you have a job, why not just move to Cleveland and do your job from Cleveland and live in a four bedroom house with two fireplaces in a nice neighborhood for a third of the cost of what you're paying in LA. Do you think that's going to impact, you know, cities like Indianapolis, Cleveland, Detroit question mark. What's your thoughts on that? And we'll wrap this up. Yeah, we're already seeing it happen. So you've got folks moving from these areas where they're priced out of home ownership. I mean, we're, we're not even talking about them selling their house and moving here. We're talking about them saying, I can't afford a house in L.A. And so I have a job. I can work remotely. I can live anywhere in the country, in the world, for that matter, as long as I have Internet. And you're already seeing the exodus from New York City, L.A., these high cost cities where home ownership isn't a reality for many people. I've got a client whose budget is one point four million in California, and he's been looking for a house for two years and he keeps getting outbid. So yeah. a guy like that, if if he could work remote, sure, you come to Cleveland. You know, Mike, remember that story? I think you told me about it. They were uh, talking about putting in some kind of super fast train from Chicago to Cleveland so that people could commute from Cleveland to Chicago. That's another market where the real estate prices are, are pumped up. So I right. think it's absolutely re reality. Yeah, I think these cities like Cleveland, Indianapolis, Columbus, Dayton, I think especially cities like Cleveland have an advantage because we have such a good infrastructure that can make a city go. We got a world-class orchestra, top five in the world. We've got a, a great museums. Uh, we have great restaurants great restaurant scene, very vibrant. We have very interesting neighborhoods from Ohio City to Little Italy to Tremont. Forest Hill, I think it's going to be a tremendous uh, neighborhood. And the quality of homes is phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal compared to any other place in the world, given the fact that back in the you know turn of the century, well, the other century, you know, in the early 1900s, you know, Cleveland was top five city. And the people that were here were extremely wealthy. And all you got to do is drive down Fairmont Boulevard. Hey, folks, go on Google Map. Drive down Fairmont Boulevard between these two streets, Lee Road and Cedar. And just drive down Google Map and take a look at these houses. Yeah. These, I mean, they're not houses. They are unbelievable mansions. We're talking eight bedrooms five baths, solarium, ballroom on the third floor. It's incredible. Yeah. Carriage yeah. house. Five to 10,000 square feet. Yeah. Just go down, just drive down Fairmont Boulevard and the streets joining that area. The house is maybe not quite as big. Okay. Instead of eight bedrooms, it's six bedrooms. <laughs> right. Um, so for, and you could buy those houses for a million dollars, LA yeah. people. So, well, and, and the other thing that you get here that you don't get in some other places is land. You know, it's not like uh, you have a little concrete patio behind your house. You know, you might have a half acre, acre, or if you want to get a little further out of the city, 10 acres. And it's really not all that expensive. Right. And then you've got one other thing. Traffic. Like no traffic. Yeah. Most of the of. most of the commuting. If you have to go to your workplace, let's say you're working downtown from these mansions on Fairmont Boulevard, 10 minutes. Yeah, you hop on the train. Minute. It's 10 minutes. Oh, no, I'm talking about driving. Yeah, it's we don't minutes. even have to drive. Hop on the train, save the parking. Exactly. So 
Okay, now next week, Mike, we're going to really do a deep dive on stats. And we're going to ask the fundamental question, how do you make money on a rental? Do people come in uh, as investors? They buy these rental properties. You've seen this for your decade plus of being a realtor. Who's, who are the successful people? What are they really making? And what is the percentage of people just absolutely hitting a wall and getting shot like our Israeli guy and yeah. losing their shirt? Literally, That yeah. is coming up on our exciting next week's podcast. Who is making money here and why? So stay tuned. Mike, thanks for your time. Go get another cappuccino and uh, we'll pick it up next week. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast with Mike Riley. Please add our show or follow us on Spotify, Overcast, Apple Podcast, or Spotify. Leave a like or comment on the video. All engagement is appreciated. Subscribe to us on YouTube as well for video content coming soon. For any Cleveland listeners or Cleveland Browns fans, you can check out our other podcast, Cleveland Browns Anonymous, for our weekly group therapy session. This is also on all the same platforms as the Cleveland Real Estate Investor.